The famous Astrakhan wetlands, the place where the Volga divides into numerous arms before flowing into the northern part of the Caspian Sea, are the feeding grounds for sturgeon, known worldwide for their black caviar. Overall, the Volga Delta is home to around a hundred kinds of fish. This is why fishers from all over the country come here. Industrial fishing is also active. Each year, fish enter the Volga from the northern Caspian, roach, herring, and sprat. The Caspian seals follow them. The ice fields in the northern part of the sea serve as breeding grounds for the seals. When the ice melts, birds from all over the world fly here. Around half a million birds gather in the Volga Delta each spring. Now, imagine that these reed-covered streams, islets, and shallow bays that serve as the lungs of the Caspian will be replaced by deserts, emptiness, and death. One of the most animated places on the planet will turn into a giant cemetery. How were they trying to fight the shallowing of the Caspian back in the USSR? Some of the projects were simply suicidal for the Caspian Sea. And what does the near future hold for the sea? Well, I should say that the forecasts are quite ambiguous. Chapter 1 the breath of the sea. Can a sea be erased from the surface of the earth? Any geographer will surely answer no, because a sea, by definition, is connected to the global ocean, but the Caspian is not quite a sea. There's a basic definition that a sea is part of the world's ocean, while a lake is an isolated body of water. Any isolated volume of water on firm land is technically a lake. Therefore, from a strictly hydrological standpoint, the Caspian Sea is actually a lake. The water level in the world's largest lake is now 28 meters below the global sea level. As the Caspian is situated in a giant depression amid the Eurasian continent, this is called the Caspian Depression. Scientists began to monitor the dynamics of the Caspian back in the first quarter of the 19th century. At that time, the level of the sea was at its historical maximum, minus 22 meters. By the beginning of the 20th century, it was already much lower. The Soviet monograph, the Caspian Sea, Hydrology and Hydrochemistry states that in the 1930s, the water level decreased by 1.8 meters. Accordingly, the size of the sea changed, losing 28,000 square kilometers of surface area, which is comparable to the territory of Armenia. The bays of Mjortvi Koltuk, Kaidak, and Sini Mortsol went dry. Soon after that, the construction of numerous hydropower plants began, worsening the situation with the falling sea level. Around the 1960s, they were alarmed. Oh my God, the Caspian is drying out. They diagnosed why the Caspian was falling. Numerous water storage basins had been built on the Volga and the Kama, many of them. These basins increased water evaporation on top of the immediate consumption by industry and population. The many ways water was with drawn from the Volga Basin were believed to be the reason the Caspian began to fall. It had fallen by three meters since 1929, which was significant and caused great damage to the economy. Ecological issues in the USSR were frequently tackled through large-scale projects, but not all of them proved to be successful. For example, there was a devastating proposal to transfer northern rivers to the south, which fortunately wasn't implemented. There was a similar plan to also divert some of the water from the northwestern rivers, North Divina, Vichegda, and Pichura, to the Volga to help feed the Caspian Sea. We know that an environmental movement arose in response to this. People protested against it because it really meant deforming the natural environment. Fortunately, eco-activists defeated the officials, and the project to transfer the rivers was abandoned. However, this project was replaced by many equally dangerous ideas. Some of the projects were downright suicidal for the Caspian Sea. For example, cutting off the shallows of the northern Caspian, which is a nursery and feeding ground for sturgeon. If we lose that, the last remnants of the sturgeon, they will just disappear. 
Out of all these projects, only one was realized. In November 1980, Karabolga's goal was cut off from the sea. It's a giant gulf in the west of Turkmenia, connected to the Caspian by a shallow, less than 200 meter wide strait. The builders of the dam chose the right moment. At the very time, the level of the Caspian started to rapidly grow. That project was extremely unsuccessful. The cutoff of Karaboga's goal contributed to the rise of the Caspian Sea level. According to various estimates, the rise in the Caspian Sea level and the subsequent flooding of territories was between 30 and 50 centimeters. During the several decades of shallowing, the residents of all the Caspian states managed to find uses for the shoreline now free from water. Many resorts, hotels, and even industrial facilities were submerged underwater. Iran suffered the most significant damage. The president of Iran at that time, Hashemi Rafsanjani, sent his son to see Sapomurat Niazov with a request to reopen Karaboga's Gol. And the president of Turkmenistan listened to him and arrived at the strait that connects the sea and the Gulf. And with his own hand, he waved a golden ketman symbolizing the reopening. And after this, the water flew back into Karabogaz Gol in enormous volume, I would say. Karabogaz Gol took in over 50 cubic kilometers of water. But the residents of the Caspian shores didn't feel relieved for long. The level of the Caspian Sea rose again for some unclear reasons. So they faced a new problem, how to protect themselves from flooding. They also needed to determine how much the water level was expected to rise, a completely different issue. And in the early 90s, a project was proposed to build a dam around the Caspian from Azerbaijan to Turkmenistan. Fortunately, this project was never implemented, saving millions of rubles and dollars. And by the early 2000s, the water level stopped rising and stabilized at minus 27 meters. Ten years later, the sea started to retreat. This perplexed the residents even more, but not the scientists. They had drawn concrete conclusions that these fluctuations are the result of the natural breath of the Caspian. Like the chest of a breathing person, the sea rises and descends with a certain periodicity. A rise or descent of about three or four meters in the sea level is not catastrophic. It's part of its normal life cycle. This cycle of increasing and decreasing occurs once or twice or three times in a century. The current retreat of the sea is also a natural process. Does this mean that the foreign scientists are completely wrong? Will there be no shallowing of the Caspian due to global warming? Nothing unusual is happening. These are alarmist publications sometimes get attention, but I know the authors and have visited their institution. These authors warn that the level of the Caspian will fall by tens of meters. However, it depends on the calculation method. Their methods are not quite adequate for the process being studied. The fact that the fluctuations in the level of the Caspian are natural is confirmed by archaeological excavations. The ancient fortress of Narin Kala now occupies only a small site on the edge of Derbent. However, 15 centuries ago, this citadel was much larger. It completely blocked the path to the Persian state for the warrior nomad tribes from the north. The walls of the fortress extended far into the highlands to the west and into the sea to the east. A port existed between two fortifications that were 350 to 450 meters apart. This raised many questions among archaeologists. It was unclear why the Persians protected a port with walls from nomads who never had a fleet. However, even in those distant times, people knew that the Caspian was changeable. The fortified walls were built on dry land when the sea level was at its minimum. When the Caspian rose, the fortifications created a lagoon in the port that protected the ships from waves. 
This is how this mysterious body of water has always behaved. However, the question of the impact of human activities on the sea still remains open. I'm aware of the calculations that confirm if there had been no water reserve basins or industrial plants or population, the level of the Caspian might have been around half a meter higher, but it would have been changing anyway. The principal factor impacting the Caspian's level is the flow of the Volga. Europe's longest river is the source of 80% of the sea's water inflow. Near Kazan, another major water artery, the Kama, flows into it. Many more medium and small rivers also contribute to the Volga Basin, which has an overall surface area of over 3 million square kilometers. Moscow and the adjacent territories, almost all the way to St. Petersburg, form part of the Caspian Sea Basin. Every drop of water and every snowflake that falls here eventually makes its way to the Caspian Sea. The hydrometeorological processes that form the flow of the Volga and other rivers have not undergone any major changes. Moreover, there are some indications that the flow of the Volga may increase in the foreseeable future, paradoxically due to global warming. The warming of the atmosphere increases the number of extreme natural events, such as heavy rainstorms and snowfalls. I should note that the forecasts are quite ambiguous. They indicate that if it gets a bit warmer, the overall flow of rivers will increase. However, if it gets significantly warmer, the flow will decrease. In any case, the forecasts suggest that climate change will lead to changes in the Caspian Sea level. It's not just environmentalists who are concerned. The local economy will also pay the price. A decrease in the sea level is problematic. It leads to mud accumulations in ports and water supply inlets and causes issues with fishing. Conversely, a rise in the sea level is also detrimental. All of our buildings, clinics, resorts, and plants are all under the threat of flooding. To prevent losses, we need to develop the ability to accurately forecast changes in sea level and to revive the Caspian monitoring system. Since perestroika, it has faced significant challenges. However, in recent years, the issues concerning this sea have been brought to the international level. The Caspian 5 summit, which includes Russia, Kazakhstan, Turkmenistan, Iran, and Azerbaijan, is held regularly. Major oil and gas companies are also interested in creating a robust ecological monitoring system. Each year, around 1.5 million barrels of oil are extracted and transported in the Caspian Sea. Its leaks are quite rare, but they can have catastrophic outcomes, resulting in tons of dead fish, poisoned seabirds, and suffocated seals. The Caspian ring seal, which is on the endangered species list, numbered over 1 million in the late 19th century. However, due to uncontrolled hunting, the population decreased to around 350 to 450,000. In 2022, the Caspian ring seal population sustained yet another devastating blow. In early December, hundreds of dead seals were washed up on the beaches of Dagestan. The local residents were terrified. They had never seen anything like it. The authorities urgently sent scientists to the shore. Biologist Magomed Rasul Magomedov was among the first witnesses of this horrible tragedy. My group primarily counted the dead seals. We established monitoring sites starting from the north, near Kizlyar, from Kizlyar Bay, particularly the settlement of Krainovka to the settlement of Samur on the Azerbaijani border. The overall count showed that by December 10th, 2022, over 10,600 seals had died. This is the only officially confirmed information from the Ministry of Regional Natural Resources. Many dead seals remained in the sea. Magomed Rasul estimates that the total number of dead seals was between 15 and 20,000. Normally, the cause of such a mass death of animals is evident, but not this time. The scientists failed to quickly determine why the seals died. What killed thousands of Caspian ringed seals? There were no half-dead or wounded seals. All of them were dead. And how did this Arctic animal end up in the Caspian? 
the massive Akchagil transgression was developing, reaching a level of plus 100 meters. Chapter 2 – The Secrets of the Caspian Ringed Seal the mass death of Caspian seals has been recorded before. In fact, the 2022 tragedy is not the largest in history. In June 2000, on the shores of Azerbaijan, Kazakhstan, Russia, and Turkmenistan, over 30,000 dead seals were discovered. At that time, the cause of death was a disease spread by the canine distemper virus. The seals likely caught it from wolves that targeted them in the winter. Therefore, in December 2022, the dead ring seals were initially tested for viruses and bacteria. There was another group that was busy taking various samples for virology testing. Uh, that included SARS, COVID-2, rabies, and other diseases, as well as for microbiological tests related to canine distemper and other probable possible diseases. But all of these tests, none of them yielded any positives. All of the samples were quite clean. They then suspected that the seals could have been killed by a disease previously unknown to science. However, the autopsy indicated that all the seals were healthy right before their deaths. They found that their stomachs were full of various kinds of small fish from the Caspian Sea, showing that they had been foraging until the end. They were affected by a single factor that had suddenly killed a large number of animals. The pathologist concluded that the cause of death was asphyxia. Simply put, the seals suffocated. But how was that even possible? The scientists spent one and a half months trying to solve this mystery to no avail. Meanwhile, the sea continued washing ashore more seal bodies with the same strange cause of death. One of the last washes occurred in January. This indicated the time frame of the event. There were no half dead or wounded seals. All of them were dead. They had all died virtually at the same time. In the quest for an answer, the scientists decided to pinpoint the approximate time and place of the seal's mass death. The analysis of the predominant winds and surface currents indicated that all the seals died between November 4th and 11th, while they were in the open sea over the shelf of the southern shore of Dagestan and Azerbaijan. These were the northern migrations. The Caspian ringed seals were migrating to their breeding grounds in the north, on the glaciers. The scientists hypothesized that the migrating seals encountered toxic substances on their way north, causing hundreds of them to suffocate. There could be only one source, the sea bottom. Ground scanning indicated that there are hydraulic containers below filled under great pressure with large volumes of oil, water, gas, which are periodically unloaded. The Caspian Sea Basin is characterized by various types of oil and gas emissions, such as mud volcanoes and griffins. During earthquakes, the intensity of these outbreaks can dramatically increase, to the point where the sea can even catch fire. For example, Caspian sailors recently filmed a column of fire caused by a mud volcano eruption on the Azerbaijani shelf. A similar outbreak could have killed the seals. That is why the scientists decided to analyze the seismic activity data in the Caspian Sea from November 2022, when most of the dead seals washed ashore. The data supported their hypothesis. There were around 350 small earthquakes in this area. Of these, 27 quakes reached a magnitude of 2.5, and about 6 reached nearly 4. During such earthquakes, gas outbreaks from the sea bottom increase in an avalanche effect. Normally, these gases are quickly carried away by the wind. However, when it's windless, their concentrations can remain quite high. In windless weather, a kind of lens covers the Caspian Sea, 
trapping gases. Just a couple of inhales of this propane-butane mix is enough to drive all oxygen out of the body, causing asphyxia. This is one of our principal theories explaining the cause of the death for these seals. During his expeditions, Magomed Rasul still finds dead seals on the shore. However, the scientist is confident that despite the tragic nature of this event, nothing threatens the well-being of the Caspian ring seal as a species. Its population will gradually recover. This is not the first time the Caspian ring seal has had to adapt to change, as it was initially a cold water species. Its closest relatives live in the North Atlantic. How did a seal get into the Caspian Sea, which is isolated from the global ocean? It's still a mystery. To solve it, we need to look back tens of millions of years into the past. Back then, the present-day Caspian Sea was at the bottom of a huge ocean called Tethys. It was situated between the ancient supercontinents Gondwana and Laurasia. As they shifted, Tethys gradually narrowed. This process resulted in the formation of two ocean basins. The southern basin was in the area of the present-day Mediterranean, while the northern basin, called Peritethus, stretched from present-day France to the Aral Sea. The Black and Caspian Seas were merely depressions of these oceans, and seals swam above them. This is the so-called aboriginal hypothesis which suggests that the species that gave rise to the Caspian and Atlantic Arctic seals had a common ancestor living on the shores of Tethys and later Peritethys. These regions were interconnected by the ocean, forming a single habitat. Parts of the land continued to rise out of Peritethys, with mountains growing. Over time, they divided the ancient ocean into separate seas, the Black Sea and the Caspian Sea. Approximately 5.6 million years ago, the Black and Caspian Seas were completely divided and began developing independently due to the significant uplift of the Caucasus. In the Caspian Sea, Balakani water basin was formed, concentrating all the water in the South Caspian Basin. Thankfully, it's the deepest part of the sea. The maximum depth of the present-day basin is 1,025 meters. So, even when the level of the ancient Caspian fell catastrophically by about half a kilometer, most species managed to survive here, including the seals. Thus, the issue of the Caspian ring seal seemed to be solved. However, modern research methods disprove this hypothesis. In the early 2000s, molecular genetic methods became widespread, allowing scientists to study the genetic makeup of closely related animal species. Studies of the Caspian seal were conducted, showing that the Atlantic and Arctic seals diverged around two to three million years ago. Now, paleogeographers at Moscow State University are trying to determine what exactly was happening to the Caspian Sea during that time in its history. To reconstruct the paleographic history of the Caspian Sea, molluscan shells play a significant role. The most important species among them is Didacna eichwald. The name Didacna comes from the Greek words di, meaning two, and dacna, meaning teeth, referring to the two teeth under the top of its shell. The mollusks of the Didacna genus evolved throughout the entire Neo-Pleistocene, allowing scientists to trace the entire history of the Caspian Sea by studying them. When the sea was warm and salty, the Didacna thrived. Their shells grew large and formed thick walls. In contrast, in desalted and cold water, the shells became smaller and thinner. Now scientists find these shells either in coastal outcrops or through borehole drilling. According to the latest data, 2,600,000 years ago, the so-called Akchagil transgression began to develop, leading to a significant rise in the level of the ancient Caspian Sea. In the relatively small South Caspian Basin, the massive Akchagil transgression began to develop, raising the sea level by 100 meters and invading vast territories. In the east, the Akchagil Sea penetrated deep into the Karakum Desert and approached the Kapit Dag. In the south, it flowed into the Volga Valleys up to Kazan. There is even a theory that, at the time, the Akchagil Sea was connected to the Arctic Basin. 
For example, Sevalod Zubakov suggests that there was a period known as the Great Bering Glacial Period. It blocked access to the Arctic Ocean for the northern rivers, causing the waters to turn south. As a result, a large periglacial lake was formed in the lower regions, becoming the water source for the development of the Akshagil transgression. During this time, the Caspian Sea became home to seals, various species of crustaceans, and a variety of algae, microplankton, nanoplankton, and more. There are many other Arctic species in the Caspian besides the seal. Fishing nets catch bull trout, cisco, and even cod. All of this seems to serve as living proof of the hypothesis of a connection between the ancient sea and the Arctic basin. But it's not that simple. Geologists and paleontologists have not yet identified the pathways of this penetration. The options include through the Kama River, all the way from the west, or from the Urals. Some suggest that water drained into the Caspian from Siberian periglacial lakes, but we don't know the exact route yet. But there is another hypothesis that the seals and other Arctic biota could have entered the Akchagul Sea from the west through the ancient Mediterranean. What we know about the history of the Caspian is that, well, it's now isolated, but in the past, it was connected to the Black Sea through the Maniche Depression. The Maniche Strait reappeared there many times, allowing mammals and fish to use this strait for migration. Now, what remains is a system of lakes in the Kumamanish Depression. Its narrow band stretches between the Azov and Caspian Seas. During the Soviet era, geologists drilled many wells here to confirm the existence of a 1 to 30 kilometer wide strait. The most striking finding from drilling in the Manich Depression, particularly in its central part where the Manich Gudilo Lake is located, involves the discovery of marine mollusk shells, characteristic of the Mediterranean basin, such as oysters and scallops at a depth of 20 to 30 meters. This indicates that the central part of the depression used to be a gulf of the Black Sea with marine wildlife. To establish with high accuracy when the strait existed, Moscow State University scientists used the method of luminescent age determination. They discovered that in the last 120,000 years, the Caspian Sea has drained its waters into the Azov and Black Sea basins. For example, the last existing strait, the Kvalin Strait, closed a relatively short time ago, 13 to 14,000 years ago. The Kvalin transgression was one of the largest rises in sea level in the history of the Caspian, caused by the melting of yet another glacier. The last inland glaciation in Europe was the Valdai and Late Valdai glaciation, which reached its peak around 23,000 years ago. As it degraded, the Kvalin transgression began to develop, raising the sea level to 70 meters or more above the present day level. At that time, the steppes of Volgograd formed the bottom of the North Caspian. The sea stretched along the Volga Valley up to the Saratov region, closing in on one of its landscape jewels, the Kvalin Mountains. Between 17,000 and 13,000 years ago, all these territories were covered in permafrost, which prevented water from infiltrating the Earth. According to Russian researchers, this dramatically increased the inflow of the Volga, causing the Caspian to grow so wide. Currently, the inflow ratio for the Volga Basin is 0.3 to 0.4. This means that out of 600 millimeters of precipitation, approximately 200 millimeters end up in the Volga and consequently in the Caspian Sea, so about one-third. In contrast, for the Lena Basin, which has permafrost, the inflow ratio is 0.8. This illustrates that if a basin is frozen, the inflow increases significantly, assuming the same amount of precipitation. Glaciation periods have occurred quite often in the history of the Earth. Each time, the climate became cold in the areas of the present-day Mediterranean and Russian southern seas. The water temperature fell to levels suitable for Arctic species such as seals, fish, crustaceans, and mollusks. As a result, these species actively migrated from south to north, entering the Mediterranean Sea first, then the Black Sea, 
and finally the Caspian Sea through the Monich Strait. This is how the Caspian Ring seals, salmon, and cisco must have arrived here. Fish populations in the Caspian have been growing recently. After the severe poaching in the 1990s, the sea is gradually recovering its fish resources. Unfortunately, this recovery does not extend to the sturgeon. During the years of uncontrolled fishing, the population of sturgeon species in the Caspian fell to one-third of its original size. The population of white sturgeon has been decimated and that of starry sturgeon has fallen to one seventh. In 2002, these species were put on the endangered species list. Illegal catching is closely monitored by law enforcement and fish farms regularly release sturgeon juveniles into the sea. Nonetheless, their numbers are still falling at a frustrating speed. Why did the Caspian sturgeon stop breeding? During breeding, sturgeon are very sensitive to both hydrochemical and hydrological conditions and which marine pest deprives them of food. This pest has virtually destroyed almost all of the zooplankton reserves. Chapter 3. Why are the sturgeons disappearing? There was something rare, primal, not just in the sheer size of the fish, but in the forms of its body from soft, coreless, worm-like whiskers hanging under the evenly shaven lower line of the head to the webbed winged tail. The great fish looked like a prehistoric lizard. This is how writer Viktor Astafiev described the sturgeon in his novella Tsarfish. They are truly present-day dinosaurs in the realm of fish. Sturgeon appeared on Earth around 150 million years ago and have remained virtually unchanged to the present day. The size of certain species also is reminiscent of ancient lizards. In this 1924 photo, an entire fishing company fits behind one white sturgeon. It weighed over a ton and had over 100 kilograms of caviar. The white sturgeon is known for its longevity. Some specimens live up to 100 years or more and reach maturity at the age of 17. Females only start to spawn at that age, so the population of this fish cannot reproduce quickly. A similar situation affects the sturgeon of the Caspian, starry sturgeon, sturlet, thorn sturgeon, Russian sturgeon, and Siberian sturgeon spend years preparing for their first breeding. Poachers often catch them before they have a chance to breed. The sturgeon that manner to enter pre-Caspian rivers to spawn face the barriers of hydropower plant dams which have practically deprived the fish of their spawning sites. Sturgeon require pebbled ground, specifically riverside pebbled ground for breeding. They don't spawn their eggs just anywhere. This specific requirement is why their population started to decrease abruptly, especially after the Volga was dammed. Our Sulak River is also heavily dammed and 90% of the water from the Samur River is diverted. The white sturgeon used to travel 2,500 kilometers up the Volga to find suitable breeding grounds. Now, the Volga hydropower plant blocks its way. Hydro engineers have created special elevators for the fish, but according to Dagestani scientists, this hasn't significantly improved the situation. Ideally, wide bypass channels and artificial breeding grounds should be built for the sturgeon. However, so far, the ichthyologists' requests haven't been addressed at the state level. The scientists have to look for more ways to restore the population of the sturgeon. This is why, both in Dagestan and Astrakhan Oblast, we started breeding resilient juveniles. We breed white sturgeon artificially in the ponds of Shirokokolsky fish farm with the goal of later releasing them into the sea. Every year, fish breeding enterprises release millions of hatchlings into the Caspian. However, out of these large schools, only hundreds of specimens survive. Many are caught in nets belonging not only to poachers, but also to fishers targeting other kinds of fish. Entangled in the nets, young sturgeons suffocate and die quickly. The fishers have to throw them back into the sea. The banks near the estuary of the Sulak River near Makuch Kala are covered in the bones of young sturgeons who died in vain. It's a sad evidence of humankind's deadly impact on wildlife. That's why we're trying to establish artificial breeding to somehow decrease the pressure of anthropogenic influence on the biological populations of this fish. Many sturgeon farms have been opened lately. It's a very profitable enterprise. 
These farms are effective for breeding many species and creating hybrids like Bester, a hybrid of white sturgeon and sterlet. Bester tastes good, grows fast, and quickly produces breeding products like black caviar. Unlike white sturgeon, we don't have to wait 17 years. Of course, hybrid Besters will not survive in the wild. However, breeding them will satisfy the demand for black caviar. Therefore, there will no longer be a need to catch wild sturgeons. Poaching will cease to be profitable. However, even if poaching completely ceases, the Caspian sturgeons will still have another formidable enemy, Nemeopsis lydii, or sea walnut. Nemeopsis lydii is a comb jelly originating from the American shores. It attaches to the bottoms of ships and travels across the world's oceans. In the late 1980s, Nemeopsis lydii reached the Black Sea and immediately began breeding at an incredibly fast rate. Nemeopsis lydii thrived because it had vast feeding grounds in the Black Sea. It fed on zooplankton and even ate the eggs of fish and mollusks. However, there were no predators to hunt it. This situation brought the Black Sea to the brink of ecological collapse. The anchovy population suffered greatly, impacting both the fishing industry and the food supply for Black Sea dolphins. So as a result, the dolphins were deprived of their primary food source. However, the invasive comb jelly did not stop there. It used ships to cross the Volga Don Canal and reach the Caspian Sea. So just like in the Black Sea, it practically destroyed the zooplankton reserves, which allowed phytoplankton to thrive and spread, and this turned the water a greenish color. As the algae multiplied, they absorbed oxygen and released toxins as they decomposed. This led to a mass death of sprat. The invasive comb jelly depleted the food sources for many fish species, including the sturgeon. If it continues to breed, it will turn the Caspian Sea into a barren environment. Fortunately, this invasive species is followed by its natural enemy, Beroia ovata, which only feeds on Nemeopsis lydii. Beroia ovata has restored the Black Sea environment to its original state. Recently, Beroia ovata has arrived in the Caspian Sea. Beroe ovata was first discovered by Sergei Vostakov, a researcher at the Moscow Oceanology Research Institute. During an expedition, he collected samples from the deep part of the sea and discovered a few specimens near Makachkala. Scientists at Dagestan University faced a difficult challenge, determining whether Beroe ovata had established itself in the Caspian Sea or if these were just a few isolated specimens. In 2021, it was discovered in southern Dagestan, near the shores of Derbent at Dagestansky Agni. It spread far to the north. It has been found in the area of Novakayakent. We found it on the territory of the city of Makachkala, the city of Makachkala, and even in the delta of the Sulak River. This means that Beroe ovata will soon settle across the sea and regulate the population of Nemeopsis lydii. Thus, nature is once again correcting the mistakes made by humans. Judging by the amount of garbage on the shores of the Caspian, we continue to make more mistakes. Fishing nets and plastic packaging of all kinds are not just unsightly decorations for the shores of the largest salt lake in the world. Their decomposition poisons its waters. This issue extends beyond the Caspian. All of our oceans and seas are under immense pressure from plastic pollution. Three major rivers flow into the Caspian Sea, the Turek, the Sulak, and the Samur. These rivers carry in a significant amount of household garbage. The main river polluting the Caspian is the Volga. Please remember that a bottle thrown into a river somewhere in the central Russian plain can easily make its way to these shores. Local residents will not appreciate this gift. Therefore, the fate of the Caspian depends on every one of us. If we treat the fragile ecosystem of the sea with care, it will not suffer the fate of the dying Aral Sea. On the contrary, the Caspian can become a thriving body of water again full of sturgeons, seals, and other types of wildlife in all their forms and functions.